the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So last year on this particular Sunday, we commemorated the anniversary of Martin Luther King, uh, and so we did not have uh, this particular reading. And so this is my uh, Defense of Thomas uh, Sunday. Uh, Thomas often, and through 2,000 years, has been referred to as Doubting Thomas. I think it's about as bad a rap as anybody in, uh, in Scripture, maybe short of Judas. But uh, um, I really like the character of Thomas, and so I hope uh, my defense does him justice. Uh, but we don't hear much about Thomas before the Gospel of John. Uh, and in John, uh, he makes it into almost every uh, funeral because of that uh, beautiful passage from John, uh, in my father's house there are many mansions. Uh, most of our funerals have that passage. Uh, and Jesus is, is preaching and he's talking uh, with such comforting words about a place prepared just for you. Uh, and I go to prepare a place for you and I will come and I will take you to where I am and you will know the way. And the other 12 disciples are sort of nodding to themselves, thinking to themselves that I, we have no idea um, where this place is, what he's talking about. But maybe we'll conference later. I don't want to really raise my hand right here in the middle of, uh, of Jesus' sermon to be remembered for 2,000 years, uh, you know, hopefully for another 2,000 years and then beyond that. Um, but Thomas doesn't care. Thomas says, this is pretty important stuff. I kind of want to know what we're in for here. Uh, Lord, we have no idea what the way is. Tell us. Please, it seems important. Give us some more. Uh, and he does. Then the next time we hear Thomas... Um, Jesus has just gotten word that his beloved friend Lazarus is right near death. And his disciples are saying, you know, Bethany is right on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Uh, if you go there, you will be arrested. It is it, it's too scary a time. They are after you. It is way too close to Jerusalem. Uh, it's not worth it. He's going to die anyway. Don't go. And Thomas says, if you're going to go to Jerusalem... Uh, to, to Bethany near Jerusalem to, uh, to care for your friend. Uh, not only are we going to go with you, but we're going to go out first. And we're going to die with you. That's the kind of passion that Thomas had. Why don't they call him passionate, Thomas? I think that would work. And, it, and then this. Uh, and some preachers actually uh, uh, suggest that uh, this meeting of the disciples after Jesus has died uh, was sort of the first real church service. This was the first church service, uh, and that uh, Thomas skipped church, uh, and that because he skipped church and he wasn't with uh, his fellow churchgoers, the disciples, uh, he missed out on this information uh, and, and then uh, was criticized for not believing. But let's not forget that the disciples, when the women came and told them the tomb uh, was empty, uh, weren't fully uh, inspired to go out and be disciples. They wanted, uh, one wanted to check for himself, Peter, and the rest just kind of doubted uh, the whole situation. But, um, but later that night, they had this uh, first church service. Uh, and it says that the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. And hear this very carefully. Uh, I uh, have heard it said that uh, a more appropriate uh, line there would be, for fear of any time religion and political power and authority are intermingled. That is what their fear was of. Um, that dangerous marriage between power and organized religion, uh, that is what they had the doors locked for, for that fear, uh, the fear that, that, that took Jesus' uh, uh, own life. Um, and so they were locked in fear, and Thomas wasn't there. And in my version, because we don't know, so I can write my own version, Thomas wasn't there because he wouldn't lock himself up for fear of anybody. Thomas was looking for this truth. He had been told that Jesus was alive, and he wanted to know if this was true. Uh, because if it was, it would change everything. And Thomas would be all in. Passionate Thomas. And so the disciples say, we met the Lord. He came to us. Uh, he visited us. We wish you were here. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have missed church. Um, <laughs> Um, and he says, you know, until I see, uh, I can't believe. Uh, and the word for belief before uh, the Enlightenment uh, had kind of a different meaning. It was a pledge of loyalty. It, I can't rend my heart totally over to this until I know. It wasn't a uh, subscription to uh, a list of historical or, not, or possible historical facts. 
it was a rending of your body, mind, and soul over to, uh, to a truth uh, that would transform his life forever. I mentioned at the Easter Vigil that uh, uh, I think 77% of people believe in the resurrection, but I can t promise you 77% of, of, of the world uh, hasn't rent its heart totally to the news that Christ is alive uh, and in the world uh, and that hope is the prevailing uh, uh, force in the universe. Uh, but Thomas knew that if he was going to accept this, uh, he was going to rend all of his loyalty and all uh, of his uh, power to this truth. And he did. He went all the way to India uh, after he found out that this was indeed truth, spreading that news uh, with the world. But I think uh, Thomas, for me, allows room for doubt. Uh, because I don't think doubt is the opposite uh, of faith. I think certainty is the opposite of faith. I think doubt has caused me more aha moments, has caused me more deeper truths uh, than any other force. That uh, doubt has been one of the greatest gifts that God has given me because it's uh, encouraged me to dig deeper. Now, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, uh, you know, giving up on, uh, 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 on the whole idea of it all together, uh, maybe not so. But having enough doubt to want to go deeper, uh, to want to know and feel uh, more uh, Christ's wounds, to me, that's a huge gift. And one of the things that we'll do in just a few minutes is we'll baptize. And one of the things that I love about baptizing is not just the, that baptismal covenant, which we say some of um, the most enduring pledges that, uh, that, that we make as a church, uh, to seek and serve Christ in one another, uh, in all people, uh, to respect the dignity of every human being. Uh, but we also say a prayer after baptism uh, that doesn't uh, invite them to drink the Kool-Aid, uh, but to bring all of the gifts that God has given them into looking at the world uh, to exploring new truths, to using doubt as a gift uh, that provides more wonder and, and breadth and depth to the way that they see all creation. And I want to read that prayer because uh, I love it um, and because it's what we hope uh, for Lance and for Charlie and for all of us uh, that, that this may still be our story. And we'll say it again later. But Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit you have bestowed upon these your servants the forgiveness of sin and raised them to new life of grace. This is the part. Sustain them, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give them an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, and a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Thomas is the patron saint of our journey of faith, that we seek something that we can give our lives over to. We ask questions. We look for more truth, because the more that we find, the more our hearts get rendered to him who gave his life for us, he who bore the wounds of all humanity. And the closer we get to that truth, the closer we get to the risen Lord, the more our hearts and our loyalties can be transformed for his purposes. So I invite you to listen to the Thomas in each of you. I think it leads to deeper truth and a bolder alleluia. Amen. <laughs>